Well, good morning and welcome to our first panel of the day. I'm Stacey Merida from American University here in Washington, D.C. Want to welcome everybody back for another full day of wonderful panel discussions, uh, great insight on research that a lot of our uh, members are conducting, and as well as we can't wait till we get to the happy hour at the end. But today, this presentation is going to be on perspectives of place, and we're so happy to have Chris Reale from uh, Ram Ram I'm sorry, Ramapo College of New Jersey. We've got Storm Glor from the University of Colorado in Denver. We got Kai Yaniki Topper from the University of West Indies, Mona. And we have Stan Renard from the University of Texas, San Antonio. Good morning, everybody. Welcome. And I can't leave out my wonderful and trusted moderator, Kelly Garner, who's going to be watching the boards for any questions. So feel free to load up, load those up, and we'll make sure that we get those in front of our panelists so they can answer your questions. All right. So what I'm going to do is uh, go ahead and get started and just have everyone to introduce themselves and give us an overview, just a small overview of your uh, research, because we definitely want everyone to go back and watch the videos and really get the in-depth information that you've provided. So Chris, we'll start with you. Good morning, everyone. Thanks. Um, so um, my project uh, actually began actually t over 10 years ago. It was a dissertation. Um, and uh, when I started looking at Muscle Shoals, uh, Alabama in general, um, as a recording scene, and then um, two summers ago, I had got some money from my college to go down and spend time in, in Muscle Shoals and interviewing and doing some on the ground research, getting ready for a, what, what's going to become a book project, what is the, my book project. And I just happened to stumble across a, literally a box in an art. There's a museum called the um, Alabama Music, Music Hall of Fame, which I speak about in my, in my presentation. And in their loft, there was a box that just said, Muscle Shoals Music Association. And this is a long standing association that goes back to the 70s that was um, basically um, all the recording studios. There were at one point, there were eight different recording studios, and they banded together to sort of just be stronger together. Um, and going through, this, going through this random box that, that just had photo clippings and newspaper articles and got me thinking about musical tourism, which has become a really big thing. I know Storm talked about this too in mean, his presentation. Um, so, and, and ever since this documentary came out in 2014, 15 uh, called Muscle Shoals, um, there's been a resurgence of musical tourism. And so this, this wound up becoming the last chapter of my book, um, which um, is now, uh, will be under, at some point will come out for the University of Illinois Press, um, probably maybe next spring, hopefully. Um, but yeah, it wound up becoming uh, just a, something I wasn't expecting to do, but just finding some random sources and saying, wow, this is, no one's ever talked about this. And let's, let's look at this very long history of how this scene went from this recording destination to now becoming this very much revered musical tourism destination and how all the stakeholders within um, within within the scene sort of um, worked together and eventually um, realized that they had something really special and how and how they promoted it. And, and also um, this this long-standing myth um, called the legend of the singing river that eventually that was long predates the music industry um, that started there um, and then they sort of they sort of adopt that as as the as the slogan. Okay. Yeah, I noticed, because uh, I was going to say, if you'll explain us the concept of cultural tourism, and you just mentioned about the uh, myth versus uh, memory. Sure. And then I also wanted to ask about uh, what uh, impact do you think the letter of Mrs. Emmett O'Neill really had on that entire um, phenomenon? Um, well, so the culture, cultural tourism right, involves anything that uh, that brings people to a region um, that's broadly considered as culture. So, um, you know, a, a museum, right? And just uh, you know, um, you know, I, I live near New York City, so there's lots of reasons to come to get culture. Um, but you know, and and and, the, and these sort of smaller locales like Muscle Shoals, which is a, a pretty small, um, uh, a large geographic region, but not a humongous population. Um, so recording studio, um, the, uh, a, a venue, um, you know, down, down in the shoals, they have, um, Helen Keller, um, was, um, was, was from there. So she's from Tuscumbia. Um, so that's so her Ivy Green's a, a big, a big destination. Um, there's also a lot of bass fishing, um, on the, on the, on the Tennessee river. So that's, that, that, that's not necessarily cultural tourism, but that attracts people. And so, um, and cultural tourism is a pretty new phenomenon, you know, obviously been around for a long time, but I think a lot of regions have, have really, um, have really looked to this to 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 um to bolster their 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 their, their economy. So that your second question about about the letter, um, most people I've talked to down there have no idea that the letter even existed. They just all took it as like, oh, there's this thing. It's always in the water, right? They, this, they, it's, 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 I mean, that's one of the phrases a lot of a lot of the locals use. It's in the water. 
Um, and so that got me thinking, well, where this, it had to come from somewhere. And, and of course there's, there's, um, Native American, um, it's a very much a Native American legend, but what I looked into was that there was this, you know, she was, uh, Mrs. O'Neill was the wife of a former governor. So she had a lot of clout. Um, so she, and she had, she, because of, because of her status had, you know, had, was able to write letters to the, to the editor, letters to the editor. Um, and she wrote this little pamphlet, which I actually found in Birmingham, um, two summers ago. Um, and so she writes this thing and it just sort of seeps out right over, over 50 or 60 years, it just sort of permeates in, into the culture. Um, and it becomes, and as I mentioned in the, in the presentation, it, be, it gets into a textbook that is, that is, um, and it's complete, it's complete myth. But Alabama is not the only place that has this um, singing river legend. It also happens in Pascagoula, Mississippi. So anybody from that region would would be familiar with with that idea as well. Um, so it is it is not unique. Um, uh, and then um, Tom Hendricks, um, who uh, wrote uh, was very active um, in, uh, in 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 bringing that idea to the forefront in the in the region, and eventually develops the idea of the singing river bridge, and through and primarily through his. Through his 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 amazing monument that he builds to his grandmother, this, this self this self made wall that's got it's thirty thousand tons. I mean, it, when I, when it was when I went to go visit it last summer or two summers ago, excuse me, it was I mean, it was it was amazing. It took him you know thirty years to build it, um, and so he was he was really the guiding force, the, the recent guiding guiding force. Um, but I, but as I said, most locals have no idea where the where the story comes from. They they think it comes from Tom, but it obviously has predates that. But it was it, but in my 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 research that it actually starts with this. I I can't find any other any other um, printed sources other than this letter from 1917. That's excellent. Okay, and in full disclosure, both Kelly and I are Alabama homegirls. So uh, That's right. uh, thank you for focusing on, on our state. We appreciate it. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I grew up in a tiny town in Alabama, and I didn't know a lot of those. Now, I've, I've driven through Muscle Shows many times. Yeah, yeah well, you know, I, I think, you know, anybody who, you know, I think, you know, think about whatever, you know, any one of us could say, you know, people tell you, start telling you history about where you grew up. You're like, I didn't know that. I would live there because right. you, you don't think about it in that way. So, um, and, and I think particularly and for the folks in the music industry down on the Shoals, that was their concern. They were they were they want to make records. And they want to make hit records, and so they they just went about their business, um, literally. And you know, the, the, and all these other things that happened that just sort of float past them. And then like, oh, that's really interesting. You know, when I, when, you know, and when I've had the conversation with with David Hood or Jimmy Johnson and um, some of the other guys, some of the some of the other iconic musicians, and I and I and I talked about this, they were just like, that sounds cool. I didn't know anything about that. So. Um, cause again, they would, they would just, they had their heads down in the studio for, you know, 30, 40 years and they would, they were too busy making hit records. Yeah, that's great. Um, and we'll come back to some, some more discussion on that. But, uh, when you mentioned cultural tourism, I thought it was such a direct con contrast to not a contrast, but a direct connection to what Storm Glower has focused on, which has right. been music tourism. So, uh, Storm, I know you've done extensive research on this for, you said about the past 18 months and. So I just wanted to get your perspective on it. Just give us a little highlight about your research and, um, and you know, maybe tell us a little bit about how you came up with those seven categories. Sure, Stacy, and great to see you. Good morning, or at least morning over here in Denver. And uh, thank you and, and congratulations to Mia and Armin and, and the crew for putting together such a great conference. It's been awesome. But uh, anyway, to your question, I started a music cities class here at the University of Colorado Denver six or seven years ago. And, uh, you know, as we went along with that course, it's, it's clear that music tourism, as Chris alluded to, is, is, a, is a growing component of being a music city. And uh, so much so that uh, sound diplomacy and uh, organization, other organizations have started little music cities, com excuse me, music tourism conferences around it. So uh, cultural tourism, music tourism, I guess I'm just zoning in a little bit more to, toward music with that, with that uh, uh, nomenclature. But, um, you know, as I saw that increased interest, I wanted to explore music tourism a little more, um, particularly because I, I knew that cities were or were not taking advantage of their music heritage. And again, as Chris shows in his, his uh, uh, paper, uh, you know, there's sometimes where cities have this, this treasure trove of heritage and, and aren't putting it to, to use in, in tourism terms. And then on the other hand, there are some cities who were taking full advantage and possibly, you know, really reaching uh, to, to make uh, music a centerpiece uh, of their community uh, 
And um, so I was very fascinated by that. And that led to, you know, that was really the impetus for my research. And it wasn't until you know, earlier this year that uh, I had the, uh, the, uh, the fortune, good fortune of having some uh, student research assistants sort of help me out with this. And as we started pursuing, you know, the research of, of music tourism, there, there, there is research out there already. Uh, there's a white paper from Sound Diplomacy, a, a great book on it, uh, and a lot of uh, research papers, again, many of them in the actually the tourism studies area. Uh, but and, and there were plenty of definitions out there. We didn't really need to define what music tourism was. But what we didn't find is, you know, a, a real uh, drill down to the, 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 um, the components of music tourism and, and the categories, if you will. And, and it, we, even within those categories, we wanted to see if there were any common attributes uh, as we was we tried to organize them in because you know if we were to introduce anyone through a paper or anything to to music tours we wanted to make it you know uh, digestible for anyone to understand those various components so so I, I so I, I had interest in whether cities are were taking advantages or advantage of it or not and I'm also um like many of us here at this conference, uh, I'm sort of a music nerd, right? And and uh, I'm always fascinated when I go visit someone's grave. I know uh, I'll be morbid for a bit, but when I go out of my way to go to, you know, a festival that's very small and really off the beaten path, and I wonder about the people who put all their energy and time into to going to those places and why. So So music tourism also fascinates me from that, that music nerd type of thing. Why does somebody go to the place where Buddy Holly's plane crashed, right? I mean, it, it, you know, why? Um, so anyway, in meeting with Shane Shapiro uh, from Sound Diplomacy early on in this, the, the students and I met with him and, and he he talked about this these definitions and, and things like that, that um, I thought, you know, really lended itself to a need when it came to the research. Um, and um, you know, as I say in my uh, in my presentation, who knows? You know, if we're right, we this is this is what we're putting forth that 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 those seven categories, and uh, you know, I, I look forward to feedback from anyone anywhere on whether we've defined them correctly or whether we're on the right track. So, okay, great, thank you, Storm. Um, and I'll, I have some questions for you a little later that I think are definitely comparable to both what you and Chris have, uh, your research has conducted when we start looking at the local economies. But uh, right now, it's like, so we've done Alabama, we've done uh, Colorado, but let's go across the water. How about Kayanike? Let's talk about what's happening over in Jamaica, man. You had a yeah. very interesting topic, uh, Jamaican popular music and transition. Um, I just wanted to, you know, have you to just kind of introduce us to your study. And, um, and I'm definitely encouraging everyone, please, please take the time to go back, if you haven't already, to review these uh, videos, because there is an in-depth amount of information. It's very enlightening. So, And also, just a reminder that if you have any questions, please use your blue ask button at the bottom of the chat window, and Kelly will be sure to uh, collect all of those. So. Kai, please. Hi, everyone. Thanks so much for having me. So um, my research is um, Jamaican popular music in transition. I say that because, you know, Jamaica is such a highly creative and musical place. And um, we've birthed many genres to the world. And nothing has really been said much about the development of our music since dance hall. And that was the baby from about the, that became very prominent in about the 90s. And there, a lot has happened since then with our music. And um, I don't see much being covered about it, especially in an academic sense where any research is being done to really pinpoint what's happening. And especially with the different, every with every generation, there's like something that's added to the point where now it's almost still you can still hear some reggae in there but it's such a big fusion of things now where everything is being mixed up like a really big melting pot 
And um, locally here, um, you have some of the people from the earlier days in the reggae and the dance hall, and they're wondering, what are the, you know, what's going on? That's not dance hall, that's not reggae. It's like, okay, then what is it? Because you know, it's still Jamaican music, clearly, you know, we're all Jamaican, the social commentary, the things that they're talking about is realities that we're facing out here. Um, so what is it, you know? So it, it, it made me want to do a case study on a specific um, amount of artists who I think go outside of that box and really can start a conversation as, you know, why is it that the music is changing? Is it all technology? Is it globalization? Is it that they're trying to cross over into the mainstream um, industry? Because, you know, our music industry and our demographic is extremely small. And, you know, to make money in the industry is really difficult. And I think the pinnacle of success to a Jamaican artist is success in specifically the North American market because we've had much, much success in the European and the um, UK market. So I think now that we're some of the trap and the hip hop that we're almost getting back reflected in both dancehall and reggae type artists, it's really something that piqued my interest because it's very, very interesting when you hear the, the blend and the, you know, the artists like Royal Blue and these are young people they're in their early 20s um, and they will sample a lot from the old, but they, make the, they mix the old and the new and they make something that's unique. So, um, yeah, it's just a very interesting time. And it's not just about the music. It's all heavy on aesthetics. Fashion is also important. Branding on social media, connecting with fans and all of that. So I think we have some group of, you have a group of artists that are almost trying to take a more 360 professional approach in really trying to be an artist and something that's marketable and digestible for those who are not Jamaican and can still enjoy the music and relate to it in some place. So that's uh, uh, where the idea for the research came from, really. Okay. And on that, you mentioned something about the challenges and difficulties in the categorization of the Native music, the cultural music. Um, and you, you've kind of touched on that a little bit. Can you expound on that a little bit more? Why is there such a, a, a difficulty in that? There's such a difficulty because um, I think because, especially with the emergence of other genres that are becoming popular now, like Afropop and some of the, um, the Afropop sounds a lot like dancehall, you know? So it's, it's to the point, I mean, trap, is something that's new from the hip hop scene, but our generation, my generation of kids, we grew up on listening to hip hop. So I think that now that we're adults, that influence is affecting our output and so on and how we want our music to sound because it's very individualistic almost and self-expression. So like artists like Royal Blue and Runkos, they're like big fans of like rappers like Jay-Z and Nas, but they also love Junior Gong, Damian Marley and um, those artists. So they come together and they still have like the Rastafari tenets in their songs, but the beat is like Afro pop, it's hip hop, it's trap all at the same time. And um, so it's, it, it, it's, that's why I say it's the categorization because they listen to it and you're just like, oh, this is Afro, this is Afro beat. It's like, no, 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 it's hip hop. It was like, no, but him just, that was a dancehall drop just now. So it's, it's a lot, you know? So that's why I said the categorize is a very liminal space that is in it's suspended in the air because it cannot pinpoint it and say, this is just dancehall. This is just reggae. It's, it is dancehall. It is reggae, but it's also trap. It's also alternative, you know, artists like Jada Kingdom and Stock Ashley, the female artists, they're even have a more crisp R&B sound, but it's still patwa. The patwa is still there, you know? So that's how you know that it's still it's like, wait, but this is not an American artist. This is definitely something Jamaica, but it doesn't really sound, you know, it doesn't have the one drop. So it's almost like, you know, so I think the traditions and the base, the foundations of the music, they're adding to the foundations to something that makes it more like a new era in the, in, in the, in the development of our music, yeah. Excellent. Thank you so much. And then we'll come back to the wonderful state of Texas, more specifically, San Antonio. So Stan, tell us about the noise restriction and the live music sector. 
<laughs> Thank you, Stacy. Welcome, sure. uh, everyone. <clears throat> Um, so, uh, you know, this is very much an exploratory project that, uh, by the way, is funded by a uh, research uh, faculty grant from MIA, and so I want to mention that, and I want to thank MIA for making this work possible. Uh, most of the funding went to support student uh, involvement and engagement in this project, so it's, it's always fun to, to have a big team of students that can come and help. Uh, and and uh, it makes the whole experiential aspect of, of learning really fun. So thank you, Mia. Um, so my work on um, uh, noise and uh, restrictions, uh, and, and particularly the live music sector, is is re really uh, is rooted in an article that I published in the Mia Journal two years ago, which is called Mapping Music Cities. So it, it ties in a little bit to what Storm was talking about, and. Um, and in that, in that particular article, I was, uh, you know, basically inventoring and mapping out using GIS, uh, you know, the cultural assets of the city. That gave me the, uh, you know, then it, it pushed uh, the envelope a little further. And, and I certainly, you know, my father is mostly deaf. It's not related to going to shows and, and losing his hearing this way, but I'm certainly attuned to that. I'm also on the music committee uh, for the, the city of San Antonio, and we were looking at, uh, you know, different friendly, uh, you know, uh, initiatives to support venues, especially venues that are, are they're all going through a tough time right now. As they're going to like transition into reopening once we passed all of this, you know, they will need as much support from the local cities as possible and, and advocates to, to uh, help them operate the best they can without having necessarily to get a lot of kickback from uh, the neighborhoods that they live in and, 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 uh, and, and the clash in between private and public, uh, you know, entities. So I, you know, I wanted to, you know, this is a new stream of research for me in some way. And, and I wanted to understand, hey, what are sound ordinances like? Are they the same everywhere? Uh, you know, how is noise perceived by different people? Uh, what is being done to protect both the venues and the venue owners, which, you know, we want to protect them. We don't want them to, to, uh, to they already like very, uh, they already struggle, but we want them to, to have as much support, both from uh, the ecosystem and the city and so forth. Uh, and, and then what is also being done to protect patrons? So, you know, I, I wanted to understand, uh, you know, some, um, for instance, uh, consumer laws and, and, and anything like that that is being done. And so, you know, I was, I like to make the comparison between the FDA. So when you now, you know, look at food at the grocery store and you turn, you know, you look at what is included in your food, you see how much sugar and how much fat and how many calories and, and so forth. But there's no such thing for uh, you going to a show. So if you're going to sit in a particular place in, in, in a venue, you know, what is the property of that? How much output are you going to like, you know, get in your ears? You know, uh, you know, what is the quality of that seat? And so I, uh, you know, that led to another aspect of this research. So it's, it's a lot of things, uh, you know, that interconnect eventually. But uh, I did this experiment with my students in a hall where we mapped out and, and took decibel meters readings at different output uh, intensity levels at, for every seat. And then we calculated, um, you, you know, the, the, in, the sound pressure level, the intensity, the loudness perceived, as well as the decibel readings. And so, it, you know, that was like 20,000 data points right there. And then I created these graphs and then, you know, uh, and then I, I took a bunch of 360 uh, pictures and I was able to create this app uh, the, this web app that has hotspots. And, you know, if we have some time, I, I'll, I'll give you a test drive of what it looks like because very few people use this. This is like cutting edge. I think it's going to like, you know, it's already done mostly by sports teams because they have the funds mm -hmm. to, in, you know, do something like that and give you a sense of 360 dimension. But they certainly never tell you how loud that seat is going to be, or how good the acoustics, or how much attenuation from the stage or from the speaker system you're going to experience. And so I'm, I was able to do that. So it's a lot of different moving parts. 
And on the back end, I'm working on a book, which is going to be the, the history of uh, San Antonio music. There's never been a book written about the, that city. It's, I'm a co-editor with two other editors. It's going to be published by TSA. We have dozens of contributors. We did a very targeted call for contributors, for experts on all these genres. San Antonio is a very, very easily definable music scene, unless like Austin. Austin, you cannot really define the scene, but in San Antonio, you can. Tejano, uh, you know, uh, conjunto, uh, actually heavy metal, you know, this, these are like really the iconic genres that define the city in some way, but we have much, much more uh, there. Mm -hmm. And so it's, it's going to be an incredible project. Part of that, there will be an entire like section on uh, the cultural assets of the city. And from a historical point of view, there'll be a part of a huge repository website that because we are kind of like the, the go-to place at UTSA for anything that's a music digital collections. And so that, you know, it will be really the huge asset, which will be dynamic, we'll be able to con keep contributing to it as we move forward, even past the publication of this particular manuscript. So okay. I know I talked about that. No, that's things. great. But no, it's, it's very in-depth study. No, because <laughs> I was going to ask you about that. With the uh, interruption of COVID-19, I know you had mentioned in your study that you were not able to complete all of that. But I wanted yeah. to understand how do you, um, or what part of this would be important for your commission that you mentioned? Um, I think you're part of the commission yes. there locally, as <laughs> well as you, you looked at possibly studying the city ordinances, uh, ticket yes. sales, and homeowners. And I, it was really interesting about homeowners because I know we talk, we, we know about external um, facilities and, you know, how there are some types of, of uh, homeowners associations that will not let the sound get a certain DBA. But I was wondering mm -hmm. with these being live venues, if all of them were um, indoor, how would that affect homeowners as well? So if you can. Well, they, tell me about you that. know, indoor, outdoor will both affect uh, you know, local residents, if they are adjacent to those, uh, uh, you know, to those, uh, to those neighborhoods. And uh, it turns out that, you know, in San Antonio, there is a, an entire, uh, it's, it's not described as a music district, but it's very much an entertainment zone. It's a whole strip. It's called the St. Mary strip. It's, called, it's like six streets in, in Austin, but this is the St. Mary strip before the entire highway system was built in San Antonio. This was the main artery to connect the South Park town to, to the main park in town. And so that area was all gas stations back in the day. And these gas stations have been transformed into music venues. And so, you know, they, the, they didn't need special zone. They, they just, just basically transformed existing commercial properties that were connected right to these neighborhoods. And um, talking about neighbor, uh, neighborhood associations, it turns out from my interviews that uh, I was able to collect since my presentation that you, you're able to see on the, on the website, um, I, I've learned that a, a lot of the folks who um, are, are, you know, are venue owners and operators uh, in, on that strip also uh, are part of these, uh, are members of these neighborhood associations so that they can have the conversation themselves and bypass the city. Uh, it, so in terms of sound ordinances, Austin has a very, very clear, uh, you know, toolkit website that is done by the Division of Entertainment and, uh, you know, uh, and, and it's, it's very clear, you know, how, how to get a permit to get a sound system to do an outdoor shows, anything like that is done very easily. In San Antonio, there is, it's, it's very opaque. There's no transparency. It's very hard to find. There's very little information available um, to the to, to public. Uh, venue owners themselves didn't know, you know, where to find it. They didn't know what is involved in it. They didn't know they needed a permit to like get me potentially, you know, move it, you know, shows on their on their patio and, and start doing some outdoors, you know, offering, especially in these times. So those of, of them who are thinking of operating outside of a, a close small venue, they could do that. Now, smaller venues tend to have more noise bleed. And a lot of these small venues on the St. Mary Strip are connected to this neighborhood. The neighborhoods are right behind them. And, and so, it, but interestingly, it's not decibel uh, level that bothers the neighbors. It's the low sounds that make the windows rattle. But you can't complain with the city because the sound ordinance does not 
say anything about this. So again, it's it's a very uh, uh, you know uh, a tricky area of study. Yeah, and in terms of okay. uh, in terms thank of, you, thank uh, you. Uh, you know, my interviews. You know, I'm, I'm I waited a little bit because I didn't want to do the interviews right after the venues were shutting down. So, but now we have a little bit of time since it happened. So, uh, and, and, you know, so I feel more comfortable now carrying these interviews and folks that are willing to talk to me. So it's really great. And the decibel meter readings, I will have to wait until it's possible to do. Stacy, uh, and Sounds we have good. a question. Kelly, you had some questions. Go ahead. Yeah, we have a question over here. Uh, there it comes. In 100 years, uh, this is from Bruce Ronkin, in 100 years, as population grows and online connectivity pervades, will place still play such a big role in culture? Thanks, Bruce. Thoughts? Thanks for the easy one, Bruce. Let's, let's, <laughs> this panel will now decide. Yeah, everybody. We will now decide the place Silence. of culture in 100 years. <laughs> Thanks, Bruce. Uh, <laughs> um, uh, well, um, I think humans like contact, um, uh, uh, and, um, and for, for me, for, you know, for me, for with the, in, in the study for my stuff on Alabama and Muscle Shoals, um, it's a lot about nostalgia and, um, and I, and I, and, and, so, and I think your, your question, Bruce, is really, is really, um, Interesting, because because what what is place when you're just when you're in, when in in the digital in, in the digital sphere? Um, for for me, it was, for, it was a lot of people going back, looking at these recording studios, these two primary recording studios, and where all these hit songs were, were made, and just going, "Wow, this all happened!" They just couldn't believe that this that one studio could literally produce hundreds of hits. But we all know that happens on a, pretty much on a regular basis. Um, so. Uh, place was incredibly important, um, and and I think. Um, that once these communities like Muscle Shoals realize their, their importance um, in, 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 the, in the bigger picture of, 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 musical, of musical, musical history, they, they embrace it and realize that they could generate actually revenue dollars from, from, from bringing people back to um, bring people back into these, into these studio spaces and, um, and selling tickets and just having them pass through as much as possible. But I, I mean, I don't really have an answer for your, for your question, Bruce, because that is, I don't know. I'll, I'll, I'm, I'm going to let, let my, my other panelists answer that and take, take, tackle that one. Well, to use a political term, that certainly wasn't a layup, um, uh, but uh, Bruce. But you know, I, I think Chris actually, I think you did a good job in addressing you know the heritage and the things that will still be part of our 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 uh, you know music uh, you know virtual hall of fame, maybe if you want to call it at that 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 point. But people will still want to go there. You know, a, a large part of music tourism is, is festivals. And while we sit here and think, I remember uh, when the announcement, the lineup came out for Coachella, someone commented on social media, how, why would I want to go hang around a bunch of sweaty people in, in you know, a, a large degree of heat um, when I could just now watch Coachella online and yet mm -hmm. tickets go on sale and it sells out immediately. Right. And, and, yep, yep. and, and so I think people still, you know, and I, I hope, you know, that my kids and, and, and subsequent generations will still want that, that personal, uh, spiritual, if you will, not, and I don't think that's a stretch, that spiritual experience that happens with being in a certain place. Now, one thing, you know, that might, you know, go along with your question is, you know, as we're, as, as music keeps developing and as digital assets, you know, digital spaces become, um, part of part of music tourism. Uh, there, that is certainly something to consider as we go forward. But as we stand here now and have these sorts of experiences available to to uh, to people, um, I think those two things will figure in in preserving um, this this music tourism culture. One more one more quick question. Um, let me allow it to come up. Okay, anonymous uh, music tourism, uh, creative placemaking, our new concepts. Why do you think did it take so long for cities to take note? 
I'll, I'll take a stab at that one too, unless anyone else feel free to chime in. But, you know, I think I, in my paper, I, I use an example of the city of Winslow, Arizona, who uh, I, I actually personally went through the town when I was a college student, which means that was, you know, many years ago. But uh, there was only one sign recognizing the, the reference to Take It Easy, the Eagles song. No one in the community had really taken a stand and said, look, we need to we need to capitalize on this. And it wasn't until, you know, that the 2000s and, you know, that song came out decades ago that. uh, So I think the element is that uh, somebody has to, you know, somebody, whether it's a citizen or a community group or the government itself has to has to say, you know, we're going to recognize this. Um, and and really put some time and money into it. And that's happening more often as uh, cities are recognizing the value of music tourism and the fact that um, uh, so many people come to the cities for those reasons. If, if, I, if I can just add, if, if I don't mind. So in the, in the, in the case of uh, Muscle Shoals, um, you know, the studios in the larger chapter that this is a uh, excerpted from, you know, the studios don't operate behind closed doors. They don't necessarily advertise who's coming in. And in Alabama in this in the late 60s or in the 60s and the early 70s, it's right, a, a very conservative society. Um, and they have, you know, quote unquote, these long hairs coming. I mean, David Hood said to me that we didn't really advertise because we because we had people coming to our studios who would live very different lives than than our than our neighbors. And so they kept it under close wraps. Um, and also in that same region, although these these businesses generated hundreds of thousands of dollars in salary and and, and money flowed through the, flowed through the, mo- the money flowed through the local economy, they were competing with businesses like Reynolds Aluminum, and um, that see, these companies that were, were worth billions of dollars and um, employed thousands of people. Where the, this local industry, the recording industry, maybe rec- maybe influenced hundreds of people, but they just were so below the radar of of the lo- of the of the the county uh, and and city level officials. They just didn't get that much. They, 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 and there was a lot of pushback. They just didn't. They just didn't see it as being something worth worth um, hyping. And it, and it, and it was it was only after the after the height of the the whole scene um, that they realized, hey, this was we you know we should pay we should pay attention to, to this heritage. Uh, if you don't mind me jumping in on sure this sir. one as well, I think a lot of it is uh, you know most of. Um, the studies that have been done and the advocacy that has been done about music cities, starting with the folks who founded Music Canada and uh, and and then like different uh, government, uh, you know, music, uh, co- you know, committees like say the Texas Music Office, for instance, and and, and the likes of these types of of, of new government agencies that are, mm-hmm. are, are there. Same same as they are doing for the film business, right? And, uh, but also I think the development of a lot of airports happened about at the same time as well. And so there was uh, a desire to like push, you know, hotel capacity, the building of new conference centers and, and bringing in big conferences that are not related to music whatsoever, but you want to attract folks by selling to them something that is attractive. A music scene is attractive. You want to get tech uh, you know, uh, employees, you need to have, you need to sell, you know, give them a lifestyle that they want if you want the best employees in a business. And so a lot of the time, the first thing that they will say is, hey, you do have a music scene. Do you have a cool downtown? You know, and things like that, that they, you know, that young professionals are looking for. And that was not something that culturally was, int- you know, appealed to folks back then because back then we wanted to live in the suburbs. So it was very different. And I think that if there was this reorientation and I think cities jumped on board because of that. Um, Kai, I want to get you in here about Jamaica since, you know, we're looking at these uh, music tourism. Do you still, does Jamaica experience this as a, as a destination that people are coming to check out? Of course, the culture, um, have, what have you seen over, over the last few years? Absolutely. It's always been like that for a long time, um, especially with our fest, our festivals, music festivals, reggae song splash, which is which was unfortunately supposed to make a comeback this year in November. Um, I don't know what they're going to do about that, but there's still reggae song fest, you know, which did a virtual show this year. We have um, Rebel Salute, which also attracts a lot of um, music tourism, as well as Dream Weekend is a huge thing. It's a huge festival for us out here. It's a destination festival in Negril, and it's about it's a, it's a party. It's a party festival, but 
the Jamaica music is a big part of it. And we also have um, live performances from our Jamaican artists out here as well. And we get a lot. It's actually more foreigners that come for that festival than the actual um, residents that go there for, for Dream Weekend. And it's like five days back to back partying nonstop. Two parties a day, morning breakfast party, evening party. <laughs> Every party is a different theme. And it's a great time. You have a, you have a throwback party, Yush. You have um, a water party. You have uh, even a little bit of soca. We have a juve and uh, live performances by, you know, Alkaline and all those um, big names that people love out here. And so music tourism is a huge, huge thing for us out here. And those are just the big, big festivals. Outside of that, there's always going to be a ton of unofficial events going on, in, especially in in um in any little community rural urban all over the map there's just always the sound system very critical in our culture and concerts out here people fly out like if protege is having a show but is having a show people will come out for it because it's a different vibe when you see the artists perform like at their home you know it's, it's, it's i think that speaks to back to place and um, um, that uh, Mr. Rankin was asking earlier, it, you can't replace place. It's, it's, it's just a special, almost like spiritual connection, like, like Storm said. And you can't get it anywhere else but there. Every vibe is going to be different. Protege is going to be a different vibe in Jamaica versus in Germany. Still mm -hmm. good, but it's a different vibe, you mm -hmm. know? So um, I can't, you can't replace like a space and all that comes with that physical space. Mm -hmm. Fabulous. Thank you. Um, Kelly, do we have any more questions? No, I don't think so. I think okay. that we caught Mamet's question. He put it in the chat to begin with, and then we caught his later, I believe. Um, it was about the city officials. But we did have one comment here that I would thought was interesting. For some fan communities, place-based identity is certainly valued. This is tied to venues in particular having bucket list venues where we'd like to see certain bands. So I thought mm -hmm. that was an interesting comment. That's true. That's good. If anyone wanted to add anything yes. to that. Yeah, I think that ties in a little bit with what I was just saying, you know, because mm -hmm. even, even for me, for certain artists I have on my bucket list that I want to see, if they come to Jamaica, that's great. You know, that's fine. But, you know, I want to see them in their elements, like, is, it would be it wouldn't be the same. Like I'm a big, for example, I'm a big Coldplay fan. You know, if Coldplay was to come to Jamaica, that's fantastic. But I so, I would still feel like I'm missing an element of an experience because like, I know they have great shows. But I definitely would want to go to where they are and just have that experience. You know, I I would love to experience a Coachella. You know, if Coachella come to Jamaica, it's not the same. It's just you know, this is like some fest. You know, so I would definitely go to. LA is all about the experience and each place is just have its own special its own cultural vibe to it and it adds to the experience. It's not just about the music, it's about a whole experience. I, 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 I want to add one thing to that, Kai, is I mean I've I've been to Jamaica a couple of times. I think it might have been Kingston, but one of the uh, memories I have is just walking around and hearing all the music. You know, that was just one thing that made it Jamaica. So mm -hmm. it's wonderful. Every corner shop, even a little stall man, have a little music going. Air, you can't go anywhere, walk too far without hearing any type of music in it, anywhere you are. That's great. I wanted to touch on local economies, um, especially Chris and Storm, and of course Stan and all, all of you. If you could speak to um, something that I know specifically Storm in your study, you were talking about the disruption. So you, you gave the example of like Abbey Roads, you know, how are people supposed to drive when everybody wants to stop there and take a picture of that iconic, you know, walk? Uh, so there's a disruption factor that happens. And then there's also the impact on the local economies, whether it's positive or, or negative. So if you can talk about that, please. Yeah. Um, sure, I could elaborate. Yeah. You know, the, the dollars that flow through music tourism are well documented and, and 
in the UK, for instance, uh, they did a study and it found $3.7 billion in the UK. Of course, they have the Beatles and, and a, a lot of heritage there, but $3.7 billion is nothing to shake a stick at. And, and that's, that's, you know, a countrywide economy, but local economies have, you know, documented what those effects might be uh, monetarily to their budget. And, you know, it's not just the uh, dollars spent at the event. You know, you've got to think of the travel industry as well. And, uh, you know, uh, everyone who goes to uh, uh, Jamaica to visit there is also contributing to the Jamaican Airlines, to the hotel, you know, the hotel rooms and all of that. And sometimes the challenge is what is the reason for being there? You know, uh, there's uh, uh, research that was done in San Francisco, for instance, and and, uh, you know, this could be true with what Stan mentions, that St. Mary's Row, you know, there are people in San Antonio for some other reason, for business or things like that. Uh, but, but they know and they hear while they are there about these places. So then they go. So is that a music tourism dollar or is it, in, you know, where do you draw the lines to it? In, in many ways, it's a challenge to delineate, you know, why why someone is there in the first place and, and then, uh, and then the dollar spent, of course. Um, so, uh, that would be part of it, but yes, there are, you know, uh, Abbey road, I think is, is a, a perfect example of how, you know, there are dollars that have to be put into that. There's also work that has to be done. For instance, someone mentioned, or, or I think, uh, some it, it's come up in the conversation about venues, right? Uh, if a venue starts getting run down, are we doing the right thing and making it in historically preserving it, but yet the city may have to fund uh, or, or, or the renovation of that area. Or as Stan said, if there's noise ordinances that the city has put in place, which are affecting, you know, the opening or the potential closure of a venue, sorry about the kids noise. Um, but, uh, the, uh, the potential closure, that's where the government has to decide or local authorities or, or uh, area authorities have to decide, are we going to put up with this in the name of preserving it? Uh, and, and we always hope, you know, of course, that they'll go in our favor. But those are some issues that do come up. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Also, the Americans for the Arts have, you know, some, some nice data that uh, is available on their website. They, 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 they document easily that about one dollar spent on you attending a show generates seven dollars of direct, uh, mm. you know, uh, cultural, uh, you know, inflow into uh, the local economy. So, to, you know, so that's that certainly helps, and that does not include the hotel stays. This is just for the locals. So the hotel stays is just gravy on top of that. And uh, you know, usually if you see music cities tend to grow. Uh, yeah, if you, you know, travel to Nashville, travel to uh, to Austin, travel to San Antonio, you see you see cranes everywhere. There is more buildings being built. Uh, uh, you know, they tend to you know uh, develop all sorts of buildings. Now, those buildings are not necessarily tied to the music industry, but indirectly they are. Absolutely. And Chris, you touched on this in your. Um study with the museum closing down, but it wasn't until right. this entire reactivation that they were able to reopen it. And um, you also addressed it, like you have the Fame studio and you have Muscle Shoals, which, I mean, back in the 60s, it's like the creme de la creme of artists recorded there. They gave right. us so many hits, and yet it was still not a mainstream thing what, that people knew about it. And so I wanted you to kind of talk about that. Yeah, so, you know, I, I spoke with, you know, one of the one of the things when I was down um, in Alabama a couple summers ago, I spoke with a lot of the county tourism heads. Um, so there, there are two different counties to the, across the river. So there's Colbert County um, and there's in Florence Lauderdale and they each have their own tourism bureaus and they're literally like maybe 10 miles apart. Um, um, and uh, so the Florence Lauderdale is, is the bigger of the two and they have a very fancy um, new convention center. Um, so one of the things um, is, uh, yeah, so the, so Muscle Shoal Sound, um, eventually sort of uh sort of peters out in the in the 80s although, although it was there for a while and then it just sat dormant and fame was fame was and still is an operating studio 
Um, and so, but in, as I mentioned in, you know, back in the, um, a little while ago, like this, the studios just didn't get, they, they, they didn't really advertise to the public. Um, and, and, and the, 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 the tourism officials have told me that back in the eighties and nineties, they would take a tour bus by and they say, Oh yeah, that's fame studio. And that's where this song's recorded. And this, and people said, Oh my God, it's amazing. And that was it. Um, and then, you know, and kind of speaking what to both what Storm and Stan were just talking about too, like the, the, the all the, all the, all the tourism officials spoke to, talked to me in about dollars. They said, if I can get someone to come here and we have an event at the, at the Hall of Fame, and I have a musician play for them at night, and then we, you know, they they for, they, they, they they spend another twenty bucks, um, and they and they get we get someone to come and play for them, and they get another hotel night stay, that, which means maybe another dinner, another breakfast, and you know, and all the and and the hotel stays, the hotel stays get put income back in the county tourism. So they they all talked about it as, in terms of economics and 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 making making people going from a one night stay, maybe a two night stay, or maybe even wanting to come back. And and that's I think one of the what a, a place like Muscle Shoals, one of their challenges is what brings people back obviously people go to nashville repeatedly or austin or jamaica or or in certain name a big city here but they the, the tourism people in alabama want people to come back um and and and, and you referenced the museum itself they just because it was it was just mismanaged and it just shut down for two for you know for about 18 months um, right so yeah thank you um kelly has a question and then kai i have a quick one for you and stan i want you to kind of tell us about that incredible app that you created and then we'll be winding up so go ahead, Kelly. Okay. Uh, Stacy. there's a good comment. I think that, that uh, it's worth mentioning here in the chat uh, from Monica Herzig. Those economic impact studies received a lot of criticism because the calculator algorithms don't include in-kind donations slash sponsors and similar so it's tricky to use them as arguments, but they certainly document the breadth of impact. Any thoughts? Uh, uh, th that's true. I mean, it's a hard thing to document. Uh, in kind, by, uh, by definition, means someone gives you something for free. So uh, it, doesn't, it has certainly a cost that is associated to, to it, and anyone who writes grants understands in kinds very well. Uh, uh, but uh, at the same time, sponsorship is, again, something that is not usually disclosed publicly. So you don't really know how much sponsors really gave you. So that, again, is very difficult to track. So Monica is absolutely right about it. Uh, a lot of prosperity calculators or economic impact studies certainly like miss a lot of uh, uh, points because they, they're based on either the, the Census Bureau data, and which does not account for any of these things. So it's, it's absolutely correct. Thank you, Monica. Storm, were you going to say something about that? I was just going to agree. It, it is challenging in, in many ways to pin down those numbers, and, which is probably why we don't have them as widely available as we would like. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, real quickly, Kai, you had talked about the, um, the reggae festival, uh, revival. So is this a, a nationwide, Jamaica nationwide approach to kind of restoring the or um, authenticity or the originality of reggae music itself? You're on mute. Right, the reggae revival, it's not necessarily, I wouldn't call it like a nationalized or nationwide thing. It's more came from an initiative between Dottie Bookman who was one of the co-founders of Manifesto Jamaica. And one of the objectives of that organization was to really build up the creative community and the creative industries simultaneously. And one way through which they did that was through the music and musicians. And from then, Dottie Bookman and Protégé, who are colleagues, they kind of met, met up and, you know, there were other artists like Janai, Nomads, and all of them had like very similar, they were thinking very similarly about something. And um, together they kind of went out and with an objective that, you know, went to positive music, conscious music, we want to um, promote black love, African pride, that sort of thing, spirituality. So in the Janine is like a yogi, you know, and um, they did that because at the time, Dance hall was extremely prominent within society and that was influencing the youth the most. Um, I remember, because I remember being in high school, very affiliated with dance hall. I wasn't really that much interested in reggae. 
it was a little too slow for me and you know I think it's like all right you know that is like family music when you're hanging out it's Sunday music for when I clean it but um when these artists came out protege kabaka pyramid jesse royal ibamar and i they got me to tune back in and i was like hey that sounds really cool like what is that you know so um from there you know i'm i do yoga now you know so this like this is not like anything forced it's just something that happened and the media kind of took it all the way with it you know um but awesome. it really started out to be as like a like a community effort to really build up community, build up back that prominence of reggae within our social structure. Mm -hmm. And um, it was very interesting time in between 2010 and like 2015, there was a lot of reggae events started to pop up again. I had like a whole reggae week in college. Monday is inner city dub, Tuesday is Sankofa sessions, Wednesday mm -hmm. is dub wise, <coughs> Thursday is vinyl Thursdays, Fridays is dub school. You know, okay. Saturday arrest and then Sunday is Dub Club, which is Perfect. up in the hills of Jamaica. So it was just more things like that. Mm -hmm. And those artists were very focused on having really good visuals for their videos. It's not just about the music, but, you know, cool visuals as well to really bring the message home. And um, so that is more it. It was like that group of artists, like an era more than like okay. a nationalized thing as an like era. Okay, yes. great. Thank you. Thank you for mm -hmm. clarification of that. Well, this is uh, this wraps up our time. I uh, can't thank you all for participating. Thank you, Chris. Thank you, Stan. Thank you, Storm. Thank you, Kai. You had incredible studies. I'm still encouraging everyone. If you have not had a chance to review their videos, please take the time to do so. And of course, I think most of them uh, included their contact information. So if you have any questions about it, please feel free to reach out to them individually. Kelly, thank you for your assistance. We're going to end with 30 seconds of Stan and his incredible app. Thank you awesome. all. Thank Thanks, you, so Kelly. Much, Thank you. Thank you, everybody. And uh, here it is. Uh, so share. There we go. So I don't know if you can all see this, but, uh, you know, this is what the app looks like. So you have different, like, viewpoints of different seats. Uh, throughout the hall that you can uh, click, you can, uh, and, and each of the seats will have, you know, both a sound map that shows the individual, um, uh, you know, sound properties of that particular seat as well as where it's located. Um, and, and the hotspots allow you to travel to different uh, uh, view vantage points of the hall so that you have, you know, the experience from these different uh, uh, vantage uh, points uh, with all the data available to different customers, as well as, you know, the ability to see a, a pop-up show in the actual space, uh, you know, at the time so that you can see what to expect, uh, you know, from that uh, particular space. And that's, you know, pretty much all the time I have. Stan, Thank you all. Stan, can you put that in the chat? Can you put a link to something like that in the chat? If you have an FTP server, I can. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Or where to find you, where to find you okay. as well. Uh, okay. You know, Stan Renard, that UTC, that EDU, I can send you okay. the whole package by uh, email and then, uh, you know, instruction on how to load it and how to uh, embed it into Great. a website on YouTube, okay. on Google Maps. Great. Okay. Great. Thank, Thank you. you all. We got to get out of the way. Thank you.